welcome to the Invest for More Real Estate Podcast. My name is Mark Ferguson, and I am your host. I'm an active real estate investor in today's market. Having done over 140 flips, I flip from 15 to 30 houses a year. I buy residential and commercial rental properties, and I'm an agent with a team behind me who have sold thousands of houses over the years. So on this show, I talk about myself, my career, and advice, as well as interview other amazing agents, wholesalers, landlords, flippers, and the companies that help those people succeed. So before we get started, if you're interested in help from me, I've got discounts on my coaching products just for podcast listeners. Head over to investformore.com backslash discount. That's investformore, invest, F-O-U-R-M-O-R-E.com backslash discount. And you'll see coupon codes for my coaching products. I have video training series on flipping, on getting great deals, training for agents, training for rental properties as well. And many of those come with personal coaching from me. So I hope you enjoy it. I hope you enjoy the show and let's get started. Hey, it's Mark, and we're back with another guest for this week's episode on the Invest for More Real Estate Podcast. I'm really excited for this guest. Today, we have Christopher Waters from Waters International Realty, and he has built a really cool brokerage kind of around the team model. And as many of you know, I just started my own brokerage as well, so we're just getting up and running. So I'm excited to talk to Christopher and learn about how he built his business, not only to help my listeners out, but to help myself as well. So Christopher, thank you so much for being on the show. How are you? I'm great, man. Thanks for having me on. No, I appreciate it. Yeah, I always start every episode with some background, some history on my guests. So let's get right into it. And can you tell us, you know, when did you first get started in real estate? What sparked that interest in the business? Yeah, great question. So in 2006, I was in my senior year of college and to pay my way through school, I was mowing lawns and I was mowing, a, I mowed a lot of yards. I was doing about 20 to 25 homes per day. I would pick up day laborers to help me and was doing about 100 lawns a week. And one of my most pain in the ass customers had a, he was a really nice guy. His wife was even nicer, but he was a pain in the ass because he was so particular about his yard. And so anyways, he had a a small mom and pop real estate team. And in my senior year of college, you know, he was asking me what I was going to do when I graduated and, you know, said that I was getting a degree in finance and I was going to go, you know, on all these job interviews. And so as I got closer to graduating, he was telling me, he said, you know, you should really consider getting into real estate. He had personally been in the finance world and told me about the ups and downs of corporate America. And I started actually going on job interviews. And I don't know, this will sound very maybe slightly egotistical, but I was like going on these job interviews and I had these people interviewing me and I just, I felt like, you know, they should be working for me, not me working for them. And it was just, it was like the weirdest kind of feeling, you know, like I had built a pretty successful lawn care business. I I mean, I get it. That's like, not like some really sexy business or whatever, but you know, you learn all the fundamentals of building a business, accounting, managing people, all that good stuff, invoicing and whatnot. And so like, I just, you know, just had this, I got this like sense of being almost like unemployable. <laughs> like I couldn't go work for somebody. So I joined this real estate team and uh, was on the team for four months. And I was going in all the training and all these, I was reading all these books and this was, so this was end of 2006 and of 07, right after I graduated. I, you know, was not very humble at that point in my life and felt like I could do everything bigger, better and faster than everyone else. And so against the wishes of the team leader I had at the time, I started doing some different lead generation activities and about four months in basically gave my notice and quit. And I went and joined this like boutique brokerage that focused on farm and ranch. And I had no farm and ranch background, by the way. I'm like, grew up in suburbia of Austin, Texas, and, you know, no background in real estate, no entrepreneurs in my family or anything like that. And we lived in just like a typical house. But I had a customer refer me to this guy. I was like, hey, you really need to go work for this guy. 
So I joined on this boutique brokerage and then this guy said, Chris, you're 21. You should go learn as much as you can about the industry, like all the behind the scenes stuff. And so in 2007, the oil and gas industry was on fire. Like the price of natural gas was $13 per MCF. It's now $2 per MCF, by the way, natural gas. So he convinced me to become what's called a landman. And so I was kind of like an, a freelancer, if you will. My job was to go track down the owners of mineral rights and basically spend a lot of time at the courthouse researching deeds and like figuring out who owned the land. And so I did that for two and a half years and was like super, super miserable. Like I hated the research part of it. It just sucked. And the whole time I was in it, I just kept reading and learning about real estate and marketing and was fascinated by lead generation. And I started a blog on this website called activerain.com. And you could go find my blog articles I posted back from like 2007. And so I was just becoming kind of obsessed with lead generation. But I was, you know, during the day, I was a landman. And in 2009, the market crashed completely. The Dow Jones went from you know, 10,000 down to like 4,000 or whatever it was. And, you know, that was just massive hysteria in 2009. People were running around panicking. And so I, I actually got laid off as a landman. They let go of a thousand people in Dallas, Fort Worth, where I was working as a landman. And for that whole three years, I was still kind of moonlighting as a real estate agent, but not really doing any deals. And, you know, the market was horrible. And I was like, man, what can I do to make money in a down market? And so for whatever random reason, I stumbled upon an article that said that alcohol sales typically go up when the market goes down. And so I had never been in the bar and restaurant business. There was a loan officer that I knew, like that I used to send deals to. And he grew up in the bar and restaurant business and he was, you know, struggling too. And so I invested all this money into this bar and restaurant in the beginning of 2009. And it was a epic failure in a matter of only seven months. And when the bar and restaurant closed down, like it had now been four years since I graduated, uh, going on four years since I graduated college. And all I thought about was marketing and lead generation specific to real estate. And so I said, you know what, I'm going to do whatever the hell it takes to succeed in real estate. And I'm just going to just dive in and I'm not going to, you know, be moonlighting as a real estate agent. Shit, I wasn't even moonlighting. I wasn't doing any deals. I was just reading and learning. And so I was literally at the end of 2009, I was dead broke because I lost all my money from this bar and restaurant. And my girlfriend at the time was buying me taquitos, like 99 cent taquitos from Whataburger. And I was sleeping on a red Ikea couch in her apartment. And I was, I was like beyond broke. I mean, I owed more people money than, you know, I could even remember. You know, the market's horrible at the end of 2009. And I said, you know what, I'm going to just get laser focused. I don't care how bad it sucks. I'm just going to dive into real estate. And so I put my membership fees on a credit card and I just started cold calling like crazy listings that had failed to sell. And basically between the beginning of 2010 and 2013, I um, started off building the traditional brokerage and I hired like 15 to 20 people. And at the end of my first year, we had like uh, somewhere between 15 and 20 people. And our whole team had sold like, I think it was like 90 some odd houses. And I was like, man, this is horrible. This is like pathetic. Like I, I knew people that were a single agents selling 100 homes and I've got, you know, I've got 20 people. And so at the end of, in the summer of 2010, I believe it was 2010 or uh, end of 2010, I I said, um, I'm just going to burn all this down and start over. And so I started employing this team model and it worked like gangbusters. The following three years, my team grew up to 325 transactions. We did, I think it was around two and a half million in GCI and that was annually, 325 transactions annually two and a half million or somewhere around there in GCI. In those three short years, I netted a million bucks. And now, you know, I'm able to net a million dollars every single year. And so it grew super fast. It worked really well. And then, you know, started expanding outside of my local market after that. So that's my long-winded answer to your question. (laughs) No, that's great. It's funny because I had a degree 
from in business finance. And I went to um, looking at jobs and I'm just like, man, I feel like I'm going to be a bank teller. That's what's available for me right now. And my dad was in real estate. So they, I'm like, I'll just work part time for him. And that's how I got into the business. But um, yeah, I, I had the same mindset of just like, I can't work for somebody else. It's just not going to work out. So yeah. that's that's funny. Going back to when you first were building your first team and cold calling listings, like what was your life like back then? I mean, were, were you just calling like crazy? How many hours were you working? What was what was it like? Yeah, I mean, in the beginning, I didn't have a lot of business. You know, in the first the first three to six months, I didn't have a lot of business. But basically, what my day looked like was from seven forty five in the morning until about eleven or twelve. I was prospecting, setting appointments, and then in the afternoons, I was you know going on those appointments. I, you know, for the first three years, I pretty much worked seven days a week around the clock. I mean, I would start my day at 6.30 in the morning and sometimes would go until one or two o'clock in the morning. You know, I started building a, a team pretty quickly. And so my schedule looked like as I kind of shifted to building a team was I would spend my mornings prospecting for listings. I would then finish the morning, usually like the last, you know, from 7.45 to 11, I would prospect. And then from like 11 to 12 or 11 to 1, I was prospecting to find talent to join my team. And then I, I spent all afternoon and evenings going on appointments and then and meeting people. I mean, that's pretty much what my schedule looked like for, you know, up until the summer of 2013. In the summer of 2013 is when I took myself out of the business completely. I stopped working with buyers. I stopped working with sellers. And I just focused on building the business. Right. When you were building your team, who was the first person you hired to help you out? Uh, So when I started building a listing inventory, so two parts to this question. One is I, when I first started building a listing inventory, the first thing I delegated was like putting stuff in the MLS and like getting stuff listed all over the web. Zillow, Realtor, Trulia.com, like, you know, Craigslist, all those different types of things, making flyers, all that kind of stuff. I started leveraging that out using a virtual assistant service and I used, it's called myoutdesk.com. And it's a staffing agency and it's and they started specifically for real estate. The guy that started the company r- ran a real estate team and so he understood real estate and you know he built all these training programs to train virtual assistants in the Philippines. So I, I had him working for me at like you know seven dollars an hour, which included them covering the cost of training that person and holding them accountable. So that's the very first person I brought on, and on like kind of like the operations side, so that I could you know leverage my time and get more efficient. And then you know I was generating a crap ton of buyer leads with my listings, from sign calls to like you know people inquiring from Craigslist and online. And so I started hiring buyer's agents to work these buyer agent leads. And, you know, after there's kind of this whole roadmap of like who to hire and when I screwed this up, like every way imaginable, you know, there's a book written by Gary Keller called the millionaire real estate agent. And that was my original source of inspiration. But honestly, I I found a lot of holes in the book and, you know, not to discredit Gary Keller. I think the guy's genius, but you know, his book was written in the late 90s and in the mid 2000s, like technology really changed the game immensely. And the whole idea of using virtual assistants and all of these things, like it changed immensely. You know, in the 90s, people didn't have like an MLS they logged into. They used like a binder and all the MLS listings you had to print out. So, the game really got changed in the late 90s and then even more so from a lead generation perspective in the mid 2000s. And so I actually personally wrote a book called The Million Dollar Real Estate Team and basically documented my journey and like who to hire and when to hire them. Like, for example, you know, you want to hire a buyer's agent for every 30 to 40 leads you're generating. For example, once you've got more than um, between, I, th- I think a high end number is 20 listing appointments. Once you've got 20 listing appointments being set per month, you want to make sure you've got a listing agent to go on those. Your transaction coordinators can handle about 50 files at one time. 
about 20 of those can be an escrow, about 20 of those can be active and 10 coming soon. Like that's what their pipeline looks like. So there's all these things that I kind of just documented through the book of like, you know, who to hire, when, how much work can that person handle? And so, you know, it's, we would need a much longer call for me to tell you exactly who to hire and when. But I think for anybody just starting out, your first hire should be a, a virtual assistant or a, a secondary option is hire somebody local and just get them part time to help you do a lot of the administrative tasks so you can focus on maximizing your revenue dollar per hour that you're producing as a salesperson. No, that's great information. I know, yeah, we don't need to go into all the exact details, but um, yeah, leveraging your time is so important no matter what business you're doing. And we do have a lot of agents and investors who are listeners to the podcast. And one thing I'd like to ask you too, you know, when you first start out, you're doing all this cold calling where did you find success in getting clients? Like, were you doing something different from other agents? Was it just persistence and a number of, you know, there are so many deals per calls you made. Was there something different you were doing than other agents were doing? You know, the thing that I got, I just built a habit of was there's kind of in the sales game, you hear all these like statistics about like how 86% of people will call a lead the first time. 40% of salespeople will call a lead the second time, 20% will call a lead a third time. You know, and then like when you get to call six, call attempt number six, like, I don't know, some crazy low statistic, like three or 4% of salespeople will call. But yet the most optimal number of call attempts to have the highest conversion is between call attempt number six and seven. And so what what I did in the beginning was I had a, a dialer called Mojo, M-O-J-O. And Mojo, you can, I don't use this anymore, but it still exists. And I think the laws have changed around speed dialers, but Mojo is a speed dialer and you load all these phone numbers into Mojo and it'll call up to three numbers at a time. And so I basically built a database. I used, back then I used something called Red X, which still exists, super inexpensive. And I built a, you know, a large database of expires and withdrawns. And I was going, you know, two to three years back in time. And so I had thousands of thousands of thousands and thousands of expires and withdrawns, especially because the market was horrendous at the time. And there were so many listings failing to sell. And I loaded it into Mojo and I just, I was reaching those five, six, and seven call attempts because I was just calling them over and over and over and over and over. And so that was like one habit I built was getting really disciplined about the dialer and not letting my mindset get affected negatively. You know, whenever I had a call list and it, and it would show me that I tried calling them like four and five times. So that was, you know, I think a lot of people can like poo poo on the idea of like, you know, they tell you to call expireds and withdrawns and you call it, try calling them once or twice. And then you're like, oh, this doesn't work. But the, the real secret sauce is not to get you know, discouraged after calls one, two, three, four. I mean, you know, dial six and seven are the most optimal dials for highest conversion. And then there's, they say that like after call attempt number seven, it's a law of diminishing return. So I, that's the important thing. And that, that really doesn't matter what lead source you're working. Like every single lead source, you should be dumping into a dialer and calling it six to seven times. And the thing that I found that I think really, to answer your question, differentiated what I was doing from everyone else is just my sheer volume of the number of times I would try to reach somebody. So that that's all kind of like step number one. That's like the first domino you got to knock down. And then the second domino in terms of like best practices from a lead conversion perspective was every time I hung up the phone with somebody, my goal was to get their permission to call them back. So like if they weren't ready to buy or sell in, you know, three to, if they weren't ready to buy or sell right now, I was asking them for permission to follow up. And then I asked them to tell me when they would like me to call them back. And so like, what you know, for example, expired a withdrawn listing, you know, they'd say, ah, oh, we're going to list it next year in the spring. I would then follow up and ask them, well, you know, when should I follow back up with you to interview for the job of getting your home sold? And they'd say, well, call me in February. And so what I would do is I'd usually cut that time in half, right? They'd say, call me in 12 months. I'd start calling them at month six. And so I had a a, a calendar with like just a massive to-do list of callbacks. To be honest, my results, the first six months I was prospecting were horrendous. 
Like I was terrible. Like I was prospecting three hours a day, four hours a day, calling hundreds and hundreds of numbers. And I was lucky to set one appointment uh, a week. And so, uh, you know, it was by the first six months, I was taking like maybe two listings a month on a good month. And that, and we're talking about prospecting, you know, weekends every, I mean, every, seven days a week, you know, like uh, I, was, I was applying massive amounts of effort. So those are the two big things is the, your call attempts. And then secondly, building a huge list of callbacks. And so ideally you also collect their email address and like you add them to your, your email list and create like a market snapshot for their neighborhood. So you can stay in touch with them via email also. So those, those were the big, I think, actions that I was taking the differentiate from other agents. All right. No, that's great information. And it's funny because I, I was going to buy some properties in Florida. I didn't end up doing it, but um, I was trying to talk to agents down there and I would call people and I would send emails and I'd say one out of five agents would respond to me from the, for, for me contacting them. So yeah, yeah it, it takes a lot of work to become successful in anything. And persistence is definitely key when you want to be a, a good agent. Looking back on how you started and how your business runs now, how do you do things differently for lead generation and, and using your time to get those leads? What's kind of interesting is like your lead quality from what I have found is in direct proportion to what you're, you're willing to spend per lead. So like the more you spend per lead, typically the higher the quality of the lead. And so I deem the quality of a lead, you know, how fast they're going to buy. Like good, you know, they've got, you've got good contact details and they're ready to buy within the next 90 days. And so I think you need a blend of lead generation strategies. You know, if you're a brand new agent, you don't want to go drop, you know, $200 per lead because your sales skills are not that good. Even if you have a sales background and you're, you know, you're a proven salesperson, the thing you're going to find in the first six months as an agent is that, you know, it, you've got to develop a script and like get really good at overcoming objections and getting the marbles out of your mouth. And so the first, the first six months, you know, you should be going after generating like just massive quantities of leads at a really low cost per lead so you can sharpen your sales skills. And then as your sales skills improve, spend more in terms of your cost per lead, spend more. So like I use, I have, I mean, we have a massive arsenal of stuff. We do, we spend money with Zillow, truly a realtor, Google AdWords, retargeting ads. We spend money on Facebook. We, so that's all the, you know, the digital type stuff. We spend money on radio, TV, billboards, newspaper, direct mail. So what, you know, what's kind of interesting is like the, those old school medias, your cost per lead is really, really high, but the quality is also very high. You're not going to get as many leads, but it's going to be a warm lead. And ideally the conversion cycle is substantially shorter. So anyways, it's over the long term, you want to diversify your lead sources so you're not reliant on just one because I think lead generation is always changing. And then two, I think you want to pick your lead generation strategy based off you know how skilled you are. And if you're a single agent, you know, you're going to be the most efficient in terms of generating the most money per hour by focusing on listings. So I would do a lot of my legion focused on uh, sellers and not buyers. And, and those are two totally different beasts in terms of how you generate a buyer lead versus a seller lead. No, that's, that's fantastic information. And we do a lot of the same thing ourselves. And it is just, yeah, getting your name out there and just, yes, bombarding <laughs> the market. I mean, when you first started your brokerage, did it take a while before you kind of gained some traction and had name recognition in your area? Or were you kind of just going all out from the very beginning? Yeah. I mean, I was, I was broke. I mean, I didn't have any money to spend on marketing in the beginning. And I don't think anybody knew who I was until I started doing more mass media, like radio, TV, billboards. I think that's when people really recognized who we were. It, that's kind of more just a function of your advertising budget, you know? Like you could you could dominate the web and I think you could build a lot of awareness in the marketplace. Like if you're if you have the number one website that drives more traffic than any other website in your entire market, I think that's a quick way 
to build a lot of name recognition. I read this book by Jack Welch, who was the former CEO of General Electric. And he said something really interesting in the book. He said, you're either number one or number two in, in a particular niche or product or market or whatever. And then the people that are three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, et cetera, they are all just fighting for crumbs. So my, my advice to anybody is to try to pursue a lead generation source where there's going to be an ample number of leads, but where it's not a crowded space. I think that's really important is, is if you can go into your market and execute a lead generation strategy that's very scalable. And what I mean by scalable is like, you could get hundreds and hundreds of leads from it. That's where you should go. Because, you know, it's like if you were going to go do a direct mail campaign and like go target a neighborhood, like you'd never want to go into a neighborhood where some competitor already has 30% market share. It'd be, you know, it'd be a total waste of time. There's another really good book called The 22 Immutable Laws of Marketing. And I think it's a good little checklist to help you determine, you know, which kind of niches you should develop in your marketplace to generate buyer and seller leads. Great information. I think one thing I'm really curious about, and I bet a lot of other people are too, is because I hear I've never done radio or television advertising, but I know agents in my area have. What what kind of costs are involved if you want to advertise on the radio or television? So, I mean, every, every market's different, but the I think your keys to success on radio is even if you're in a small market and it's and it's a lower cost, you need to have a, a pretty significant amount of money in the bank. And you need to look at radio as being like a, a minimum of a one-year investment before you start seeing your return. So for example, like if you are going to invest in radio, I think the minimum amount of money you need to have set aside is at least fifty to sixty thousand dollars. And so the reason I say that amount is because, you know, radio is at minimum is going to be about three to five thousand dollars per month to like, you know, really crush it. And so there's I reference something called I, I read this in a book, it's called a cash conversion cycle. So in other words, like if you invest a dollar into radio, the question is how long until you get that dollar back? And so typically the answer is a minimum of six months. So you start getting some cash flow back in month six, but in the first six months, you've got, you know, six months times, call it, you know, five grand, $5,000 per month in advertising. So that's 30,000. And then you've got the expenses of taking a listing on. Now, if you are a single agent and you do radio, you're throwing your money away. You shouldn't do radio until you already have some brand recognition and you've got, you know, a minimum of like, you know, 20, 30, 40 listings. If you don't have a minimum of 20, 30, 40 listings, don't even waste your time. You've got to have a little bit of name credibility so people are hearing about it on radio and then they're seeing your physical signs. Like that's the one two punch you have to have to make radio work. And and then again, secondly, the money. So like 30 grand will cover your hard costs for six months. But then again, you've got the variable expenses of taking a listing on. So like, you know, paying a courier to deliver flyers, putting the sign up, putting an MLS, paying to get flyers created. You know, maybe you do boosted ads on Facebook per listing. You do a direct mail campaign. Like there's, you know, there's all these variable expenses when you take on a listing. If someone's listening to this call and they're saying, you know, it only cost me $200 to list a property, it's probably because they're not doing a very effective job. Uh, marketing it or two, they're a single agent and they're doing everything themselves. So that's why I say you need about 50 to 60 K because you've got your upfront expense of the radio and then you've got the variable expenses of each individual listing. And then you've got to wait six months for it to come back. And then, you know, the, the third piece is you've got to nail your call to action. Like you've got to have a really compelling call to action to get people to call. So I think, you know, those are some of the, the pieces to the recipe, if you will. I um, used an agency called Motivate Media. And this guy was in radio for like 20 years. And he has it dialed 
in. Like he knows exactly, you know, how to make your campaign work and produce amazing return on investment. And that's who I personally use. It's it's called Motivate Media. It's based out of Austin and super, super sharp guy that runs the agency. What's kind of cool is it, it doesn't cost anything to hire an agency. The radio stations, TV stations, they pay a commission to agencies. And so it doesn't cost you anything to use them and they'll help you set everything up. So anyways, those are my little tidbits on radio. Awesome. No, that's, that's great information. I know a lot of agents won't ever get to that point where they do radio advertising, but it's interesting to hear you know, the costs, how it works and what's involved in it. And I have to ask you this, you mentioned a little bit, what's your call to action or or one of them you use on the radio? So I use three different ones. So one is an immediate cash out option. Like, you know, we'll make an offer on a house for cash and close in as little as five days. And then our second call to action is your home sold guaranteed or we'll buy it. And then our third call to action is your home sold guaranteed or I'll sell it for free. And we put a timeline on all of these, like 59 days, you know, your house sold in 59 days or we'll sell it for free or 59, sold in 59 days or we'll buy it. Those are, you know, there's some other calls to action. Like, for example, we'll guarantee to sell your home in 59 days or we'll pay the mortgage. There's all these, you know, there's a lot of different creative things you can come up with. Those are three that I use. Cool. Very cool. And piggybacking off that, because I hear those guarantees and, and different things as well. How often do you ever buy a house or have that guarantee, you know, come through or you have to fulfill it? So what's interesting is like most of the people that hire us, they hire us because they hear that guarantee and it, and it, you know, kind of exhibits a level of confidence in your marketing. And so most we have we have a commission menu of options for consumers, you know, so they pick which commission menu or which program they want. And we have a, our guaranteed sale option and, you know, a a surprising number of people do not uh, select it. It's at a higher commission. And so a surprising number of people don't select it. But to answer your question about how many we buy per month, we're, we're probably buying about two to three homes every single month. But surprisingly, most of them are people where it's a situation they are about to be foreclosed on. The house is in disarray, like foundation issues, roof issues. They don't have money to get it fixed. They're behind on payments. You know, all those types of scenarios, uh, those are typically the ones we're buying. So, you know, I think our guaranteed sale, the guaranteed sale program, it's a good option for people in a distressed sale situation. You know, we, we pay, I think we pay a, a premium compared to like the We Buy Ugly Homes people. We typically pay 90% of a third party appraisal minus the standard closing costs any seller would pay if they were to sell their house. And then a lot of people say, let me see the fine print of those guaranteed sale programs, right? And the truth is, like, there's very little fine print in ours. The only fine print is that the if the home is located in an area where there's more than six months of inventory, then it doesn't qualify. Like, that's typically a, you know, a horrendous market, you know, if you've got more than six months of inventory. Usually something is like, you know, something bigger is going on that's causing the market to be really, really bad. So that's one exception. And then if a house has previous foundation repairs or needs work or roof repairs or needs work or has insurance claims over $5,000 because of water damage or things like that, the home won't qualify it for our guaranteed sale. It will qualify for us to make an immediate cash out offer to buy it but it won't qualify for us to uh, list it traditionally and guarantee that it sells. We'll still take the listing on, but we can't put the guarantee on there. So that's the fine print of our guaranteed sale program. Pretty simple, pretty straightforward. So anyways, yeah, two to three homes a month is probably what we buy on average. No, it's a very good business model. And thank you for sharing all the details behind it. I appreciate that. What, you know, switching gears a little bit, you've started as an agent, had a lot of ups and downs and other businesses along the way. You've created your brokerage. Now you've got this team that's built, you know, sounds like extremely well where you're making quite a bit of money. Can you talk about the structure of your team and and what your business looks like right now? Yep. So, you know, so, so some pieces that were missing in the million dollar real estate agent book, in my opinion, was a full-time trainer and a full-time recruiter. And so like, 
if you're in in the real estate brokerage business, you're in the game of recruiting top tier talent. And it's very difficult to find out who's going to work and who's not going to work. So the one of the I read a book called The Rare Find and this this author spent like four decades going into every single industry imaginable. And the purpose of the book was for him to like share his stories in all of these different industries from the military to Teachers for America, nonprofit, that's a nonprofit, to corporate America. And, you know, he, he wanted to find out what, what made people tick, the ones that were highly, highly successful. And what he said in the book was that like the only way you find out who's going to be successful or not is to see them in action. Because the key, the attributes of people that are highly successful is they are incredibly resilient. They are very focused. They're very resourceful. They are very quick to embrace change, you know, and, and they have a ver- very much this mindset of wanting to learn and get better and better and better at all times at all things. And you only see those attributes in people through action. Like you're not going to see it in a face-to-face interview. And so the way we kind of set up our program for finding talent is we created this 30-day ramp-up program and we tell people at the very beginning of it, only one out of four are actually going to make it. And that one of you is going to quit because you didn't realize that real estate was about building a pipeline of leads and nurturing the leads and making an exorbitant number of calls and you know, trying to maintain a, a huge database of potential leads. So one person will quit because of that. A second person will quit because they are just not disciplined enough. They'll show up the first two weeks and then week three, they miss a day. So that's another, I think another thing that is very common is people are not are just not that I see. They're not um, disciplined and committed enough to it. Uh, they think it sounds sexy, the idea of being, you know, your own boss and being, you know, having a flexible schedule. And then the, the third person that usually leaves is somebody that's just not coachable. Like you tell them what to say, how to say it, you give them guidance, and they're kind of like a know-it-all. And they're just, they're not in a humble enough place in their life. And I totally appreciate this more than most because this is exactly what my problem was when I was 21 was like, I just wasn't coachable. Like I was, you know, right out of college and I'm like, had this successful business, lawn care business that I sold and way too ego driven. And so that's usually why the third person quits. And the fourth person is typically our, our keeper that'll be with us for a really, really long time. And so because of that ratio of, you know, out of four people, you keep one, you've got to constantly be recruiting and looking for people and so it's literally a full-time job to be recruiting and a full-time job to be training and executing on this ramp-up program. So what our team looks like is beyond our recruiter and trainer is I have a director of sales who oversees the listing team and the buyer agent team. And then I've got a director of operations and that person is responsible for overseeing all the W-2 employees. So transaction coordinators, our listing manager, our courier, we have a photographer on staff, our front desk gal. She manages a lot of different things for us, like helping us put together uh, quarterly client appreciation events and things like that. And then we've also got a director of lead generation. So there's three key leaders. And again, this is something that was not in the book that I read that was published by Gary back in the 90s. And it's a director of lead generation. And the director of lead generation oversees a marketing coordinator. They also work with outside agencies and lead generation systems and tools. They also might have like a technology person underneath them. Like another common thing as you build out a team is you don't ever think you really need like an IT type person. But the more and more people you have, you start finding you as the owner get sucked into like fixing people's computers and trying to help them show them how to do stuff. So that director of lead gen kind of helps oversee a tech person that helps with like user adoption, education, training, things like that. They oversee a marketing manager and then they've got all these auxiliary people they use. Like for example, the agency that manages our radio and TV and the agency we use to manage AdWords, Facebook. And then they've got the graphics designer that helps with like 
collateral. So those are your three key leaders and a little bit about the people underneath them. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, that's extremely helpful. And again, thank you for taking the time to go over there how you've built this in, in such detail. I know your book will probably goes over it as well, but it's really, really helpful. One question I have too, for you know building a team as a team owner or agents who want to join a team is how do you pay your listing agents, your buyer agents who work with you? Yeah, great question. So it's really interesting. Like we, I never understood the importance of like HR documentation more so than in the last couple of years. And so like, I think you'll you can read like in any recruiting or sales book that top talent does not need to be managed. You just need to get out of their way. And another thing is like you can't actually manage people. Like if you I I had this like in the early years I had this belief that maybe I could help people be successful and what what I realized is either people have the internal drive to succeed or they don't. And So anyways, the position agreements and how people are paid is so, so important. And so you want to think about your compensation structure in terms of what specific actions do you want your people to take? Another key thing about paying people is for every incentive, there needs needs to be a disincentive if they they take the wrong action. And I actually got that idea and philosophy, if you will, from a book called Seeking Wisdom, a guy named Charlie Munger. And Munger is the right-hand man to Warren Buffett. And Warren Buffett and Bill Gates both said Charlie Munger is the smartest man they had ever met in their entire life. And if you go YouTube this guy, Charlie Munger, like you get him uh, speaking when they do the annual shareholder meetings for Berkshire Hathaway. And like the guy says like three sentences and his, when he talks, it is like these three sentences will be so deep. It takes you 10 minutes to digest what he says because it is so deep and, and just, you know, he just puts so much thought into what he says. So I got that, I, the idea of like having an incentive-based structure where you incentivize positive actions and you disincentivize negative actions. I know this is a really long-winded answer to your question. I'm, I know you want me to just say there's this split and that split, but it, it's a little more complicated. So like, you know, in the team model in brokerage, you know, you're trying to get people to write positive reviews, for example. So you can get, you know, have better conversions and click-throughs on Zillow and Trulia and Google. And so one thing in our position agreements are that if the agent gets a four star or five star review, they get a small bump in their commission. It's nothing huge, it's just small. It's two it's two point five percent if they get the commission if they get the review online. Now if they don't get a review, like no review at all, or it's a bad review, they take a reduction in their commission rate of two point five percent. So that's like just one small little nuance and it's you know, Charlie Munger says in his book, people frequently discount how powerful incentives are. But the key to it is for every positive um, incentive, there needs to be an equal negative incentive for a negative outcome or no action. So our, you know, the, our position agreements are a little bit complicated because of how our team is set up. But in a nutshell, it all is set up based on the actions salespeople take. So another example is like we have this commission menu of options for consumers. And, you know, there's all these like value add items for people when they pay 7% or 8% or 10% that are included in those commission options. And so if a salesperson, for example, gets somebody signed up at, you know, seven, eight, or ten percent, they're going to make a little bit more money, and so their commission split's going to be better than if they just took a traditional listing at six percent. And some people might be wondering, you know, are you just charging people more, and you're not doing anything more for them? And that's totally incorrect. Like our commission menu, for example, at ten percent, that's our guaranteed sale option. You know, our eight percent option, for example, includes a insurance policy to cover 
your c- cover the client after the sale. And so it, it's up to $25,000 in legal fees. So I don't know about in other states, but in, you know, in Texas, we have E&O insurance, which protects the broker, but it doesn't protect the consumer. And so if you sell a house as a consumer and something comes back on you, even if you didn't do anything wrong, you're going to get tied into legal fees trying to defend yourself. And on average, it's anywhere from ten to $20,000. It's so like one of the perks at the higher commission option, for example, is what's called seller shield, which is an insurance policy was created by an attorney. And it's and they give you up to $25,000 in prepaid legal fees, which protects you after the sale of the home. So it protects the consumer, not the agent. Agents have E&O insurance. Anyways, there's a little bit more work that goes in to like the higher commission priced menu items. And so that's why the listing agents make a little bit more money. So I'm sorry, I can't give you an exact number. It would, I, again, I'd need like an hour to go through the position agreements <laughs> to show you how our buyer agents and listing agents get paid. But I can tell you it's a tiered structure and our business model is set up to create a 30% pre-tax profit. Like that's our goal. I can't like guarantee somebody will buy like one of my franchises and create that, but that's how our business model is set up. And if you execute correctly, you should be able to hit it. I've got teams that are at 35% pre-tax profit. Cool. No, no, that, that helps. And again, thank you for going into detail. I know we're, we're spending a lot of time on details and going through some of this stuff, but I think it's really helpful for agents and brokers as well to hear that information. You've got quite a business you've set up. So congratulations on, on all the work you've put into it and, and the results you've seen. Are you looking to keep building it? Are you looking to stay where you're at? Are you happy with how things are going or do you have any huge plans for the future? Yeah. So as I alluded to just a second ago, like you know, I found a really big hole in the real estate industry. And the hole that I found was that there's not a franchise system that currently exists to help people scale the the team model. And there's not a roadmap that exists. You know, I, I published that book um, last fall and it was my personal journey of doing it. And it's, you know, it's a book. There's only 200 some odd pages and so like I can't document everything perfectly, but I talked about, you know, the failures, I talked about what worked, and I talked about the different stages of growth. But to really, you know, accelerate your growth curve, you really need like a full-time coach that's been there and done it. And so we what I found was when I studied all these franchises, none of them were focused on making agents highly productive. In fact, the way the system is set up is it's it's set up for agents to fail. Like most agents, for example, like when they join a brokerage, you know, they've got to pay for a desk, they've got to pay for lead generation, they gotta pay for marketing, they gotta pay for all this stuff. And they run out of money. It's primarily a lot of it's because, you know, it takes so long for you to get a deal and then to get that deal closed. And unless you have a big bankroll, you're going to be at a, you're going to be behind the eight ball, you know, and then finding somebody to mentor you, coach you and train you. That's another challenge. And and most traditional brokerages are set up so that you'll, you know, as a broker owner of a franchise, for example, your your goal in the business plan is that you just recruit as many agents as humanly possible and then upsell them on your training. And so again, it just sucks the money out of the agent's pocket and they can barely afford to live. And so in the in the team model, there's a a strategy we implore and or we implement and we we set up something called a brand ambassador program for the team. And that's how we raise the capital at no cost to the franchisee owner so that they can bankroll the success of their agents and also bankroll their lead generation efforts. So my big, hairy, audacious goal is to basically build a franchise system across the United States. And we we actually received approval from the FTC last fall. And so we're now licensed in 32 states and I'm taking on people to basically coach, train, and help them find massive success as an independent brokerage using the team model and executing on the processes and systems we've developed and helping them do that in record time. 
you know, my, my goal is to get somebody to, to scale to over a million dollars in gross commission in less than three years. And I've got, I started doing this with people like testing it in other markets back in 2015. And they're having like amazing, amazing success. Took one guy that did zero deals. He relocated to a new city and he's in his second year this year, and he's going to close just under 260 transactions this year for one point, just under 1.5 million GCI. That's what he's on pace for. And he moved to a city he had never lived in before. He had no marketing budget. I also did this in a really small town in Texas called Amarillo. This woman had been an agent before, but she hit a ceiling and she couldn't figure out how to exceed the ceiling of 30 to 40 transactions. And in less than 18 months, she got to 167 closings. Again, didn't you know have to put in a, a small fortune to, to really ramp up. So you know, my goal is to really help create a really clear roadmap for people to build the team model within a brokerage and do it really, really quickly. So that's my ultimate goal. I've kind of mapped out the entire US. I see that we could have 2,100 franchisees and I want every single one of them to be selling north of 500 homes and be operating at a 30% pre-tax profit. So that's my big hairy audacious goal. Awesome. No, great job and congratulations on yeah, not not holding yourself back, that's for sure. <laughs> Great information, amazing detail you went into on a lot of this different stuff. You know, now if people want to reach you, they want to, you know, maybe get more information on your book or the franchise, what's the best way for them to get in touch with you? Yeah, great question. So you can go to Amazon, it's called the Million Dollar Real Estate Team by Chris Waters and Bradley Pounds. And we created a landing page for the book, and if you order it from that landing page, you'll get a signed copy. It's um, wirbook.com, wirbook.com. And then I'm also really easy to reach on Facebook. My information is in the back of the book. The book was really written for people that are already agents and they want to find out how to grow really fast. And my information's in the back of the book. So yeah, and I think you can you can read reviews about the book on Amazon. We we published it last fall, so it's been out for like six months now. So yeah, and you know, people can call or reach out to me or Facebook, whatever, um, if they're interested in talking about the opportunity to be invited into our franchise system. I'm only taking on very select people right now. My goal is to take on 25 people and make them like crazy, wildly successful before we, you know, really blow it up, if you will. And I'm personally coaching and training everybody and helping them, you know, through the process of growing and building a, a mega team. So anyways, check out the book and my information's in the book. Awesome. Well, well Christopher, thank you so much. I think that's all I had. Uh, anything we missed or anything else you want to go over real quick? No, man, I'm excited. I'm, I'm, I'm excited to be on your podcast and uh, I'm happy to answer any follow-up questions from any of your listeners and anything I can do to constantly help improve the, the industry and make other people better is only going to help all of us in the long run. So yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing from your listeners and hearing what they think and answering any questions they may have. Awesome. Well, Chris, thanks so much for being on. We'll have the show notes up on the website and people can comment there and ask questions. And it'll also be on YouTube where people can um, ask questions as well. I um, really appreciate the detail you went into and all the information you provided. It was a ton of help. And um, yeah, we'll have to keep in touch for, th- for sure. And, and thanks again for doing the podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me on. 